أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ما يفتح الله للناس من رحمة فلا ممسك لها وما يمسك فلا مرسل له من بعده وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العليج العظيم My dear brothers and sisters at Daribatul San Francisco, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll start this lecture with a personal experience. In the month of January this year, I visited the United States to give a series of lectures in Chicago. I had a good time in America, and when I returned to Europe, I was already looking forward to my next trip and I was told that I will be visiting America a couple of times in this year, first in the month of Ramadan and then in the month of Muharram and Safar and give lectures at different Islamic centers, including these lectures which I am um, recording for you now. But what I did not know at that time was how the world will be looking in a couple of weeks time. In fact, only after about six weeks, the world was a completely different place. Transatlantic flights had been canceled and many opportunities that I and many other people used to take for granted were no longer there. And many doors that were open started to close. Restaurants, cafes, even hairdressing salons, they were closed under the lockdown. And also schools were closed. Not only that, even the doors to Islamic centers and mosques were closed. Not only that, the doors to the holy shrines in Iraq and Iran were also closed. And now we are in a situation eight, nine months onwards that we are sitting with many doors still closed. The world is a very different place and none of us had expected it to be like this. Not in the month of Muharram, not in the month of Safar. But now we have to live with it and we have to hope and pray that these doors will open and inshallah they will open sooner or later. But what is important is to understand what we need to do when the doors close upon us in our life. Closing and opening of doors, coming and going of opportunities is a part and parcel of life. But if we can understand the fundamental principles related to the closing and opening of doors in our lives, then it will become easy for us to deal with the situations like what we find ourselves in nowadays. So the opening of closed doors is the topic of this lecture. And what you are going to learn in the next 40 to 45 minutes or so is the following. First of all, I will discuss the uh, fundamental principle that is related to the opening and closing of different types of doors in our life. What does the Quran tell us about it? And that is a very important fundamental principle. After that, I will discuss different types of doors in our life. And I'll give a few examples. Different types of doors that are closed from time to time upon us and how we can get them to open. And what is the key to getting the closed doors to open? And then in the last part of the lecture, I will give the historical accounts 
of some of the events that took place in the 61st year of the Islamic calendar and the events that happened to the grandchildren of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when they were brought from Kufa to Syria. But before I proceed, wherever you are, from the bottom of your heart, please recite a beautiful salawat. I recited verse number two of Surah Fatir in the very beginning, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ مَنْ رَحْمَةٍ فَلَا مُمْسِكَ لَهَا وَمَا يُمْسِكْ فَلَا مُرْسِلَ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens for the people from his compassion, from his mercy, from his rahmah, no one can withhold it. And what Allah withholds, then after that, no one can release it. And he is Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. And I did not deliberately translate Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim into English. I will explain the meanings of these divine names in a bit. First, what does it mean, the opening? What Allah opens for the people from His Rahmah? The key word here is ما يفتح الله يفتح And I want to spend a few minutes explaining this term يفتح And please pay good attention because we are going to derive some key lessons and principles that are very important for us to understand in the context of closing and opening of doors and if we could understand those principles then it will become relatively easy for us to go through difficult times in our life. So yaftah, fattah, fatah, fatih, miftah, mafatih. These are all different words that we have all heard in uh, different contexts, in different duas, in different verses, in different uh, discussions. They all have the same root and they all are related to opening. Opening of the knots, opening of uh, closed doors and, and uh, and uh, opening of uh, uh, the ways, creating ways, creating uh, exits, uh, removal of pains, removal of calamities, and removal of difficulties, solutions to the problems. This all is related to the word fattah. We have this dua, uh, this book of duas called Mafatih al Jinan, Mafatih, the keys to the heavens. Keys to the heavens. Mafatih al-Janan. Keys to the heavens. So, key. What is the purpose of key? To open. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a name. And that name is Fattah. Al-Fattah. And this name is of significance. All the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are significant and important, but in this context, the name Al-Fattah is very important, very significant. What does Al-Fattah mean? Al-Fattah means the one who has the keys to all the locks, who can open all the locks, who can open all the doors. And therefore, the Urafa, the Gnostics, they lay a lot of emphasis on the name Fattah. And they say that if you are stuck in life, if you have problems in life, if you have troubles in life, then recite the name Fattah. Ya Fattahu, Ya Fattahu, Ya Fattah. Recite it. And some Urafa say that everybody who recites Ya Fattahu 70 times after Fajr prayers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors for him or her. Different kinds of doors, the doors of rizq, different problems will be solved and so on. And many people recite these names. And often it happens that we recite these names many times and many, many, many times and still our problems do not go away. And here I want to make a point quickly. 
So if we recite the name Ya Fattahu, Ya Fattahu for a very long time and our problems are not solved, the doors do not open. The doors like, for example, we are looking for a job or, or want our business to flourish. Uh, someone wants to get married. Someone is uh, sick, is uh, suffering from ailment. There can be many things that we want the problems to go away. And still they do not go away, despite having recited Ya Fattahu many times, despite having recited Ya Fattahu 70 times every day after the Fajr prayers and many other dhikr and adhikar. Why, why does that happen? Why does that happen? Well, the first reason could be that often we recite things without understanding what they mean. If you just recite something without knowing, what it actually means, it is not going to have a profound impact on the soul and it will definitely not have any belief behind it. The power in a dhikr comes from the belief and understanding and ma'rifah. So if you want to recite Ya Fattahu to get the closed doors to open in your life, then you have to understand what does Fattah mean. Fattah means the one who has the power to open all the doors, who is independent, who is unlimited, whose knowledge is unlimited, whose knowledge, whose wisdom, whose power is unlimited and everything is in his hands. He is Al-Fattah. Therefore, he can open any doors. But he opens any doors when he deems it appropriate. And that is why he is what? He is Al-Hakim. He is the All-Wise. You remember I said I did not deliberately translate the two names Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. In the previous lecture I told you, just taking one step back, in the previous lecture I told you that each time a certain name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appears in a verse, it is closely linked with the main message being conveyed in that verse. Please pay attention. The main message in this verse that I have recited, verse number two of Surah Fatir is the opening of closed doors. So the name Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim is linked with that key message. The one who opens the doors, the one who opens the mercy from his mercy, that is Al-Fattah. And he has to be Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. And we have to know the meanings of these names. We have to ponder over the meanings of these names before I go into the details of describing Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. Continuing the discussion, I was uh, going through that without understanding the meanings of uh, the names, the divine names or the dhikr or adhkar, there's not going to be much benefit. And often it happens that we become tired of reciting certain things, reciting the names, reciting the dhikr. The first day we are very uh, much involved and motivated and we recite something for 50 times, 100 times, 200 times. Then we become tired because we don't even know what we are reciting or, or what kind of uh, beautiful messages it carries. And the same is true for the lengthy du'as we recite at our congregations. I mean, it has happened to me and I, I'm sure that it happens to many people that there are lengthy du'as in the Arabic language being recited because we have to recite them somehow without understanding the meaning of those du'as and then it turns into a nasty chore. It turns into a tiring exercise, into a torture. And then you start counting the pages, when will this torture end? I've been there, done that. So if we do not understand the meanings of the dhikrs, the things that we are reciting, it's going to be difficult for us to continue to keep reciting them. And it will be difficult for us to have the, the impact, to get the desired results from those recitations. That's why it is very important to understand the meanings of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the verses that we recite. 
So Al-Fattah means the one who opens all the doors. And how can he open all the doors? And when does he open all the doors? Al-Fattah has to be Al-Aziz and has to be Al-Hakim. The verse ends with these two divine names and they are closely linked with the message of opening of the doors. Al-Aziz, what does Al-Aziz mean? Al-Aziz is translated into English as uh, the exalted one who has might. Al-Aziz, the powerful one, the exalted one with might, the mighty God. But if we look, uh, take a closer look at Al-Aziz and uh, dig a little bit deep and then analyze uh, this name, then we realize that it has a, has, a, has a deeper meaning. And that is someone who cannot be influenced, who cannot be made to surrender. Al-Aziz is related to the word Al-Azaz and al ardul azaz is a piece of land that is so hard that nothing can diffuse into it, that nothing can impact it, nothing can have any effect on it. And Al-Aziz is the one. No one can influence him. No one can force him to change his plans. No one can make him to surrender. No one can have any effect on him because he is independent. He is all powerful. No one can make him do things. He does things that he deems appropriate based on his eternal knowledge and his eternal wisdom. Therefore, he is Al-Hakim. The verse ends with Al-Aziz, Al-Hakim, the one who is all-powerful and the one who is all-wise. And therefore, he opens the doors for us. And he closes the doors for us when he finds it appropriate on the basis of his eternal wisdom, eternal knowledge. Recently, someone asked, a couple of months ago, someone asked our great marja, Ayatollah, Ayatollah al-Uzma Sistani, may Allah protect him and prolong his life, that how should we look at the current situation, the COVID-19 and so on? And Ayatollah Sistani, he replied, what a beautiful answer, what a dignified answer, what a Qur'ani answer. He said that we should look at it like a test and we should look at it as if uh, like everything happens in the universe on the basis of the divine wisdom. However, we cannot always understand and comprehend it. That was the answer of Ayatollah Sistani. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the all-wise, and then who is Al-Aziz, who is powerful, who, has in who is in full control of his affairs, he opens the doors for someone, then no one can close them. Be sure no one can close them. So we have to turn to him. We have to pin our hopes on him. It is he who can open the doors for us, no one else. If we think that someone else can open the door for us, if someone else can give the job to us, if someone else can solve the problems we are facing, if someone can help us establish our business independently, that is shirk because no one owns anything. No one has any power. In the prayers we say, بِحَوْلِ wa قُوَّتِهِ أَقُومُ وَاقْعُدُ With the power of Allah, I make my movements. With the power of Allah, I stand up and sit down. We cannot even stand up or sit down without the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to understand these things very well. And first, we have to understand these things on a rational level by doing, having the activity of the brain, understanding uh, the Arabic, looking at the words, the meanings of the words, the meaning of the dhikr, the meaning of the divine name, and understand theoretically what does it mean, understand theoretically that everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the activity of the brain. It hasn't reached the heart yet, but it all starts from the activity of the brain, from reflection, from thinking. 
That's why the Urafa, some Urafa, the Gnostics say that one should understand concepts and write certain things. What we have understood about Tawheed, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, write that with the pen of intellect on the sheet of heart. But it all starts from there and then gradually it travels towards the heart. So we have to understand these things, my brothers and sisters. And this starts with tafakkur, reflection. And the Imam has said, Imam Reza, peace be upon him, has said, it's not the abundance of prayers and fasting that is worship, but it is a tafakkur, it is the reflection, a tafakkur fi amrillah, reflection on the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amrillah. And one definition of Al Aziz is the one who is Al Walibu ala Amrihi, who is in full control of his affairs. So, why shouldn't we turn to him who is in control of his affairs? Our master, our lord, our owner, our creator, our sustainer, the one who gives us rizq, the one who sustains our existence. If we turn to him, and rely upon him, then the doors will start to open for us. Even if we find ourselves in a situation that looks impossible to come out from, he can make things happen. And here I would like to tell you a true story. But before I do that, please recite a beautiful salawat. There was this 10 years old boy who was stuck in the darkness. And I mean literally in the darkness. He was in the pit of an abandoned well. He was thrown into an abandoned well in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in the Middle East. And there was no chance that he would survive. But something remarkable happened. While that boy was in the pit of that abandoned well, there was a caravan of traders that was going to Egypt and they lost their way. And then they went astray in the desert and they became thirsty and they ran out of water and they were looking for water and all of a sudden, in the middle of nowhere, they spotted an abandoned well. And they said, let's try our luck. luck. Where else shall we find water if not here? So one of them went to the well. And while he tried to take water out of the well, he pulled that boy out of that well. And that boy was none other than Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. You know that story. You see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works, how he creates exits for people, how he opens the doors for people. Only if we learn to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He made the whole caravan of traders to go astray and forget their way. They were experienced traders. They knew their way, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them to forget their way and took them to that well to save Yusuf and then took Yusuf from there to Egypt to make them the, to make Yusuf the king of Egypt a couple of decades later. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. So we have to learn this, my brothers and sisters, in these difficult times that the doors that have been closed upon us only and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can open. And for that, we do not even have to recite things hundreds of thousands of times. No, 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 no. Some people recite certain dhikr for hundreds of times and thousands of times and hundreds of thousands of times in some cases, in some extreme cases. But to be honest, if one has a strong belief on the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then one does not have to do all that. And here I, I will tell you another true story, and that is the story of Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him. We all know that Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, was swallowed up by that big fish, let's call it a, a whale, and, and he was in the belly of the whale, in the darkness, 
darkness upon darkness in in the belly of of the fish the whale and the whale was deep under the surface of the sea and what did he do he did not lose hope even in that moment he did not did not lose hope and whom did he turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how many times did he recite the dhikr of Yunus the dhikr Yunusiyah that the urafa lay a lot of emphasis on and in our congregations and in, a, in our culture in, in, in our communities often people uh, recite this uh, dhikr la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al many times some people recite it hundreds of thousands of times but how many times did Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, actually recited that dhikr? How many times? Thousand times? Hundred times? Ustad Jawadi Amuli, Ayatollah al Uzma Jawadi Amuli, has said something very beautiful once. He said that if someone has the faith, like the faith of Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, reciting the dhikr of Yunus only once is sufficient to get out of the darknesses. Only once. Prophet Yunus, peace be upon him, said only once, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al I have been unjust to you. You are my ilah. You are worthy of being worshipped. No one else. Subhanaka. You are exalted. You are free of all deficiencies and imperfections. I am imperfect. I commit injustices. I commit sins. I make mistakes, but still I rely on you, my Lord. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If someone has a belief like that, with ma'rifah, with understanding, and coming from the bottom of our heart, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka, inni kuntu min al only once should be sufficient for the doors to open, for the darknesses to go away, for the light to come in, to release us from the pains and calamities and difficulties. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also has His system. And his system is not possible for limited beings to understand. Al-Fattah is the one who opens all the doors. But Al-Fattah is also Al-Alim. Huwa Al-Fattah Al-Alim is in the Quran. He is the Al-Fattah who is also Al-Alim. Al-Alim is the exaggerated form of Al-Alim. Al-Alim is the one who has the knowledge. Al-Alim who has all the knowledge. The unlimited knowledge of God. Al-Alim. It is on the basis of that knowledge that He opens the doors for us and closes the doors for us. It often happens that we want something badly, but we do not get it. For us, that door has been closed. And no matter how much we try, no matter how many nadr we make, or mannat, which is said in colloquial terms in, in the subcontinent, oh, I'll go to the ziyarah, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll go to the ziyarah of Arba'een, I'll go to Karbala, oh Allah, please make my wish come true, please fulfill my wish. And Al-Alim does not let it happen. He keeps that door closed upon us. Why? Why does he do that? Because he knows that that thing is not good for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the holy book, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّوا شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ This verse came in the context of jihad. But it has a general meaning also, and its translation is, and it is that often there is something that you like, but it is, there is something that you dislike, but it is good for you, and there is thing that you like, but it is bad for you, and Allah knows, and you do not know. Sometimes the doors are closed upon us because. It is not good for us. 
in this life or maybe in the hereafter. Maybe it's a lucrative career, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that maybe that career will lead you to uh, forgetting him, uh, becoming forgetful of him or, or becoming weak in faith or becoming less practicing. And sometimes there are things that we do not like. There is a job that I did not like. There was something at work that I did not like. Or there was a career path that I had to take and I did not like it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. In His sight is this life, afterlife, everything at the same time. And He knows where He should take us. Even if it is a disease even if it is a loss. So in these times when we are in COVID-19 times and many doors are closed upon us, we should remember this. It can be difficult to understand. It is not possible for us limited beings to understand the divine grand program of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what we can do is that reflect on the verses of the Quran and try to understand these principles that govern our lives it is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he finds it appropriate, whenever he deems it appropriate, he will open the doors of his mercy. He will open. People say that when will the vaccine come for COVID-19? And the answer is when he opens the door, no one can stop it. Now we have about 200 or more candidates for the vaccine of COVID-19. We could have 300, 500, or 3,000. It is up to him, Al-Fattah, when he deems it appropriate, when he opens the door of his compassion, the vaccine will come and then no one will be able to stop it. Maybe it will happen overnight. Maybe it will really speed up and instead of a few months, it will come in a few weeks. So who should we turn to? Who should we rely on? The scientists? The, the pharma companies? The, those big corporates, the governments, the culprit politicians, should we pin our hopes on them or should we pin our hopes on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He will open that door of his mercy. And some people might say, oh, you Muslims, you people, your religion has no place in these modern times, in this COVID-19. What is your contribution? Our contribution is to find hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Our contribution is not only that, our contribution is in the form of all those great all those great number of Muslim uh, doctors and nurses and other health personnel and many other professions in these times who are helping the societies to run and those health professionals who are on the front line, who are sacrificing their lives. They, that is our contribution, not only Muslims, also Christians and Jews and others who believe in God in, and in the hereafter. So my brothers and sisters, if someone says that, oh God, compassionate, where is the compassion of your God? So let me tell you, the compassion of God is all around us. And the compassion of God is right before us. He has opened the door of his mercy while he has closed some doors on us, on the whole world, on the basis of his wisdom. He has also opened many doors of his compassion in the form of all those health personnel. What do they reflect? They are a manifestation of the compassion of God. When someone is willing to sacrifice his or her life for the sake of humanity, for the sake of other people, that is a manifestation of the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, he will open the doors. He will open the doors that have been closed on us for years or in this year because some people have had doors closed some people want to get married some people finally want their business to uh, get back on its feet or get established some people finally want their career to uh, to take off some people want finally to get good grades and get admission in the university and so on there can be many other things no matter what it is turn to the one who can make it happen and he will make it happen insha'Allah and it takes me to the next question which is what is the key to getting 
the doors, the closed doors to open. Before I proceed, please recite a beautiful salawat. When it comes to the closed doors in our lives, we are focused on the material doors about job, marriage, business, wealth, and so on. But also, there are many other types of doors that might have also been closed on us, but we are not even aware of it. I'm talking about the spiritual doors, the doors related to our hearts, you know, when it comes to the material doors or physical doors, both have one key, the same key. We need to do something to get those doors to open. And how do I know that? Well, it is in the Quran. You might have heard uh, that ulama and urafa, they often recommend a verse, Surah At-Talaq, for people who um, do not have sufficient earning, they want them to uh, recite مَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ This, these are the verses from the Quran, Surah Al-Talaq. The key is in this verse. It tells us what we need to do for the doors to open, whether they are physical doors or they are spiritual doors. And when I say spiritual doors, what do I mean? Spiritual doors, when the spiritual doors are closed, then we cannot comprehend the deeper meanings related to Tawheed. Then we are not interested in understanding Tawheed on a more profound level. Then we are not interested in understanding the fadail of the Ahlul Bayt on a profound level, moving away from superficiality and understanding things on a deeper level. Then we are not interested in understanding the concept of wilaya on a deeper level. Then we become superficial. But when the doors, spiritual doors open, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants one knowledge and wisdom and ma'rifah, ma'rifah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ma'rifah of the Holy Prophet, ma'rifah of the Imams, ma'rifah of the 14 infallibles and understanding about the hereafter, the qiyamah and understanding about the adl, the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All these things are very difficult for us to understand and grasp. But those whose spiritual doors are open, for them, these things are easy. They understand these things and they derive pleasure from understanding these things, from increasing their ma'rifah. So how can we get the physical as well as the spiritual doors to open? The key is in the verse, مَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَا وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ the one who has a taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates the makhraj for him, the exit for him, and jarzukhum in haythu la yahtasib, and gives a rizq to him from there where he did not expect. Here, I will quickly go through this verse. It requires a, a long discussion because it has several aspects and it is very beautiful and very deep. But we have a limited, limited time, so I'll just make key points. The two key words here, makharaj and the rizq. When someone has a taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when someone obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how difficult times one is going through, one tries to follow the religion. One is not ashamed of one's religion, but proud of one's religion. One is not ashamed of practicing one's religion in public, but is proud to practice one's religion in public. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates makhraj 
large exit for him. The Amir al muminin peace be upon him, has said that makhraj here in this verse means movement from the darknesses towards the light, movement from ignorance towards knowledge, movement from shak towards yaqeen, from doubts towards certainty. If we have taqwa, taqwa means refraining from sinning, refraining from sinning. If one refrains from sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the doors, literally open the doors. Here I will tell you a true story, the Quranic story, Ahsanul Qasas, the most beautiful of all stories, the story of Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him. When Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, stood before Zulaikha, when she wanted to commit sin with Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, and she called him, he stood there before her, and there were seven doors behind him. And Zulaikha had ordered her servants to lock those seven doors so that Yusuf could not escape. And when she called Yusuf towards her and said, Come and sin, Yusuf, peace be upon him, resorted to taqwa. And he ran away from her. And when he ran away from her, it is written in the books of Tafsir that he reached near the first door that had been locked. And when he reached near the door, he only touched the door and the lock broke off and fell on the ground. Then he went to the second door, the same thing happened. He went to the third door until the last door, the seventh door. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally opened the doors for him, created the makharaj for him. It is easier said than done what Prophet Yusuf, peace be upon him, did. So my younger brothers and sisters, you might end up in a similar situation when you go to the university at work or in any other setting. Remember this. Remember this, these Quranic stories are for us to derive inspiration from, to learn from and implement those lessons into our lives. This is the perfect example of creation of makhraj for the one who resorts to taqwa. If we resort to taqwa in our own capacity, try our best to avoid sins, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do what? يَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ He will give us a risk from there where we cannot expect, where we did not imagine, did not expect from. And the risk can be material and can be spiritual. Material risk can be bread, biryani, nahari, food, wealth, job. But spiritual risk is opening of the spiritual doors. When we resort to taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase our faith. He will make us strong, firm in our faith. And also, what will he do? He will give, uh, give us spiritual sustenance. When the doors of our hearts open up, then all the worries and anxieties go out and peace and tranquility comes in. And that is the result of taqwa. So we have to work towards getting the physical doors as well as the spiritual doors open. And that we can, done, can do through reflection, tafakkur, understanding, developing an understanding, a deeper understanding about the divine principles, the Quran, the verses of the Quran, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the matters of the Ahlul Bayt, the concept of the wasila, all that, and also resorting to taqwa, avoiding sinning. But we commit sins, everybody commits sins except the infallible ones. If someone has committed sin, so what? So what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say that I will not forgive any sins. He says, do not be in despair of my mercy. Say to my slaves, those who have been unjust to themselves, who have committed sins, do not be in despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So no matter how big your sins are, and no matter how big our sins are, we should always turn towards Allah and ask him to forgive us for the sake of the 14 infallibles who are the reflection of Allah's compassion on earth 
who are the manifestation of divine compassion, who are his true representatives, who are there to embrace those who repent, who turn towards them, who turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They embraced Zuhair ibn Qayn. They embraced Hur. Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, embraced Zuhair, who used to be Uthmani. He was going to become alayhi al-la'na, but Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, turned him into alayhi salam He embraced Hur who was going to become alayhi al-la'na. But Imam Hussain, peace be upon him, turned him into alayhi salam Why? Because Hur did not lose hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the compassion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the last day, on the day of Ashura, he rushed towards Hussain. He turned towards Hussain. He left the darknesses behind and moved towards light. He left the shak behind and moved towards yaqeen and Allah created that exit for him. Because Hur knew that Hussein is a reflection of Allah's compassion and Hussein embraced him. So my brothers and sisters, always have hope in Allah's compassion. Because we believe in the Ahlul Bayts who have been giving them the message of hope, the message of hope in Allah's mercy, the message of hope in Allah's compassion, the message of hope in Allah's Rahmah. But what did the Ummah do to the Ahlul Bayt? In the previous lecture, I gave some of the historical accounts of what happened to the Ahlul Bayt in Kufa. Some people say that, the, that it was not Yazid who had ordered the killing of Hussein. Some people say that Yazid should not be blamed for what happened. He did not want to kill Hussein or humiliate the Ahlul Bayt. Then my question is, if it was so, then why were the grand daughters of the Holy Prophet brought as, a, as prisoners of war from Kufa to Syria? Why? Why were they brought to be presented before Yazid, the accursed man who was intoxicated on wine? Why did the granddaughters of the Holy Prophet had to appear before him while their hands were tied? If it was not an order from Yazid, the son of Muawiyah, may Allah's curse be upon Yazid and his father and his forefathers. It is written in the book Luhuf, by Sayyid ibn Tawus, that when the Ahlul Bayt reached near the gate of Damascus, when they approached Damascus, Lady Umm Kulthum, peace be upon her, went to Shemr, and she said to him, I have a request. Shemr, the accursed man, look, the daughter of Ali has to request Shemr for something. This is what Sayyidu Sajideen had to witness. This is the test of Sayyidu Sajideen. I dare say it is a much bigger test than any of the tests that any of the other Imams had to go through. This accursed man, Shemr, says to Umm Kulthum, What is it that you want? And Lady Umm Kulthum, peace be upon her, said to him, Look, when you take us to Kufa, make us to enter from a gate where there are not so many people and also do not display the heads of the martyrs. This accursed man, Shimr, the most wicked man, he did exactly the opposite. He displayed the heads of the martyrs on the spears and he took the Ahlul Bayt through the main gate of Damascus so that the most number of people could see them. The daughters, the granddaughters of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. It is written in the book, the Maqtal book, Luhuf by Sayyid ibn Tawus, that there was an old man who went towards the granddaughters of the Holy Prophet, the women of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all, in Damascus, and he said to them, All praise is due to Allah, who has destroyed you and relieved our cities from your men. And he has imposed the order of Amirul Mu'mineen Yazid on you. Sayyidu Sajideen saw it happen.
This is the test of Sayyid Sajideen, my brothers and sisters. That is why when someone asked, what was the most painful thing that you went through? Sayyid Sajideen replied, Asham, Asham, Asham. But Sayyid Sajideen went towards that old man. He knew that the people in Syria did not know who the Ahlul Bayt were. Because Muawiyah, may Allah's be curse, may Allah's curse be upon him. He had created this circumstances that for decades people used to curse on the Amirul Mu'mineen from the pulpits. And the people did not know anything about the family of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. So the Sayyid the Sajideen went to that old man and said, Have you recited the Quran? The old man said, Yes. Then the, then the Imam recited, Ayah Mawadda. I do not want anything from you as wage for the work of prophethood except for mawaddata fil qurba, except for the love, love for my near ones. The Imam said, Have you recited this verse? The old man said, Yes. The Imam said, We are the near ones. We are those adil qurba. Then the Imam recited a few other verses. And then the Imam recited the ayat at tahir Then asked the, the old man, have you recited that verse? He said, yes. The Imam said, we are those people who are mentioned in these verses. The old man started to cry. It is written in, ta, in Luhuf that the old man took his turban off and threw it on the ground. And then he said to the Imam, please forgive me. I did not know who you were. Is my repentance accepted? The Imam said, the Imam who is the reflection of Allah's compassion, the Imam said to the old man, yes, if you repent, your repentance is accepted. The man said, I repent. The news of that old man reached Yazid. He ordered that that old man be executed. That old man was executed and killed. Then the Ahlul Bayt were brought to the court of Yazid. Zainab, Umm Kulthum, Sukaina, all the granddaughters, the children of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And they were tied. The hands were tied with ropes. And Sayyid Sajideen has to see all that. That that accursed man Yazid who was intoxicated on wine and there was a there was a tray brought before him on which there was the head of Imam Hussein peace be upon him and then he started to whip on the head of Imam Hussein with a stick and Sukaina is there Zainab is there Umm Kulthum is there the children of the Holy Prophet are there they witness all that in the middle of all those accursed men. And Sayyid al-Sajideen has to witness all that. Sayyid al-Sajideen has to witness all that. And therefore, he said, Asham, Asham, Asham. Ala la'natullahi ala al-qawm al-walimeen. Rabbana walamna anfusana wallam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna min al-khwasirin. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accepts this azadari, whatever has been said in this majlis, we pray that he makes us all act upon that. And we pray to him that he makes this coronavirus and COVID-19 disappear. Oh Allah, you are the one who open all the closed doors. It is in your hands. Please make this virus, this disease disappear and eradicate as soon as possible so that the doors to your house the doors to the islamic centers the doors to the holy shrines can open again and we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us genuinely and truly and sincerely pray for the return of the imam of our times wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh